you been busy? Yeah, yeah, we've been marching forwards on all fronts. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> and who's the enemy this week? Um, well, as ever, our enemy is time and space. And mine is money. It looks like you've uh, mocked up a battery box here. So what's, what's the score here? How many, how many modules going here, in here? Because I know that you've made a couple of changes since we last spoke with regards to how many modules in the back compared to front. So what we've done is we've taken one of the modules out of the rear and that's given us a lot more space to work with so that we can get the contactors in there and the uh, manual service disconnect, which we could have done before, but it was a really tight squeeze and it wasn't nice. And when you're trying to get the wires on, you've got to get the connections really good. Okay. Uh, any sort of resistance on that will give you problems later on. So we've just made it a lot better pack to work on by taking one of the modules out of there and putting it into the front. Mm -hmm. Now the front box, we originally, obviously you want to keep the weight as low as possible. Yep, definitely. Get it low down to get the handling. But because of the way the chassis is curved and there's links going out there, the packaging space is really poor. So we're going to use the space in front of the motor for the charge controller and the inverter and yep. a few other bits and pieces, pumps and stuff like that. And we're having to put the battery box on top of that. Okay which is not ideal, but it means that we put everything into one box and that's quite neat. Does the bonnet, I suppose, yeah, clears nicely. Yeah, we'll Excellent. Bonnet. Uh, we've got good clearance to the bonnet. And one of the things we want to make sure is we always have about an inch of clearance between the battery box and the bonnet. Right. So that if you do manage to mow over a pedestrian. When? And they, when? And I... they smack onto the bonnet, <laughs> it won't immediately hit hard metal. Right. Um, yeah, because I know it's got some dodgy uh, air intakes on the bonnet at the moment, but yeah, I'm looking to rectify that because yeah. I don't want any of that sort of stuff I on it. That so we've got the clearances right um, and we're making up some pretty substantial structures to hold this in place. Yeah. So it's linked in with the subframe that we put the motor on. Yep. It all bolts into existing bolt holes on your chassis. Yeah, everyone will be happy on the... Uh, but yeah, all of the mounting MBT brackets front. and these frames have to be able to cope with when you eventually crash into a wall, yep. the battery box won't come flying out and either that way or that way. Take so, someone out, yeah. yeah. And what are we making the battery boxes out of just to give everyone peace of mind that it's going to be safe? So one of the things you've got to consider when you're making the battery box is what happens when someone crashes into you or you crash into someone. Or Naturally. Or backwards or flip it Sorry, or whatever. whatever. Um, so we need something that's very strong and can take multiple impacts so on this occasion and there's, there's all sorts of different ways of making battery packs uh, but for a one-off what we do is we use uh, an engineering steel that's got a fairly high strength modulus compared to other types of steel yeah so like structural steel has got quite a low strength um, so we use the the engineering steels uh, to make the basic framework and then we cross brace it um, and then we make sure that all the modules inside there's a gap around them so if anything does hit it it doesn't immediately hit a module right um, and then we've got to get the cooling plates in uh, it's going to be liquid cooled um, and all the other wiring and stuff that go with it and then on the outside we're going to put stainless steel panels so that we can unbolt them to do any servicing that needs to be done on them which will help with weight as well I suppose um, we could use aluminium, right. which would save a bit, but to be honest, the, the amount that we're using is so small anyway. Mm, there's not much of a difference. Not much of a difference. No. Um, and the, the stainless has just got a much higher strength, um, given the amount of space we've got to put it in, in there. We could use thicker amount of aluminium to make it up. but mm. Can't, can't do a clear perspex top. Um, so Probably not advisable. Although I have seen some on uh, some builds in America, which is obviously very, very bad. And yeah, no matter how much you want to shelf your batteries, that should not be done. You've got to consider what happens if it's in a crash through no fault of your own. Um, but also what happens if you're involved, God forbid, in a, a fire. So mm. you know, the sort of things you see on the motorways when several cars hit each other. Yep, you saw one on the way here, funnily enough. Yep. Yeah, you get caught in the middle of it. So you manage to stop in time, the car behind you doesn't, smashes you into the car in front. Bosh, yeah. Car in front's a diesel, splits its tank, burning diesel goes under the car. You need enough time to get out or for the rescue services to come out and, and take you out there. So all the time there's fire under the car, we don't want the batteries 
going into thermal runaway and, no. and uh, making it a lot worse. Yeah. So that's why we're very careful on the materials we use. We also use other materials inside the battery box, both to insulate it and also give it a degree of fire protection. Good stuff. And obviously it's going to be all water cooled in there. What, how are you going to be doing the water cooling for the batteries inside the battery box? So it's like underfloor heating. There's a little labyrinth of oh, okay. that yep. actually go through aluminium plates. Yep. Um, they all link together and then we have a cooling pump. Now, uh, we have a number of temperature sensors in each one of the modules. So we'll man monitor the temperature at loads of different points all throughout the battery box. Mm -hmm. Because it's very easy to have like you know, a cold spot there and a hot spot there. Yeah. And if we only measure it in one spot, we might think the battery is fine, but that battery is actually overheating. Right. So we have to measure it in several different places. Um, and the way the, uh, the cooling pump works and the way the fans work and all the rest of it maintains uh, a reasonable temperature for the batteries. And where will that water temperature uh, reading be? Will that be in the instrument cluster? Because I did notice that uh, last time I was here that you've taken apart the dashboard yep. a little. Yeah, a little bit. Um, we didn't like it, so we ripped it out. Um, mm. Now, we've got some options with temperature. Okay. Um, there are several different temperatures you can look at. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got the temperature of the batteries. Yep. Two different battery boxes. Yep. We try and maintain the same temperature at both. And we've got the temperature of the inverter and the motor and the charge controller. Now, it's quite possible for these things to run at different temperatures. Yeah. So if you wanted... We could stick loads of gauges on the dashboard and make it look like an old aircraft dashboard. Or we could just give you one gauge, which just tells you whether it's overheating or not. A green, just a green light and a red light. Yeah. Just keep it simple for me. Which is all you need. <laughs> green for good, red for get out of the car. Out of the car. Start running. Um, but yeah, no, that would be good to work out what we're doing with that. Because I know there's, there's a few different gauges on the market. Was it Speed Hut and I think uh, it was Peterson? I think that's the one based in the UK, but there's a few options there, isn't there? But... There is. There's loads of different options. So it depends what look you want on the dashboard and how much information you want to distract you from driving. Ah, yes, I can explain that. What happened? Uh, it came off in my hand. Ah, the old it came off in my hand trick. Um, a nice bit of wood, that. Is it? <laughs> what have we got going on in the back there? So in the back, well, we're working out exactly where to put the contactors and the service disconnect. Right. So do you want to have a look at it? Let's, let's have a look, yeah. So basically what we're looking at, we're trying out some different ideas here, mm -hmm. but basically we're going to have the contactors in there, yep. the pre-charge resistor, the main fuse, and your um, isolation manual service disconnect will either be here or possibly there with a, a plate over the top of it. Yeah. So that in the event of uh, some sort of mishap or if you need it servicing, this can be removed and that will disconnect the main power feed from this battery. Excellent. And we're going to have a disconnect on the front one as well, I take yep. it? So both battery packs need to be able to be isolated. So both of them will have contactors. Yep. Only this one will have the pre-charge relay in it. Okay. Because it's only one of them. They're both in series, so only one of them needs to pre-charge the system. Right, yep. Yeah. Because you need the trickle of battery power to the, uh, it's the, uh, what's it called? The inverter the, That's it. Before you put the full charge in, of yeah. course. Yes. So this will have the pre-charge and the pre-charge resistor. So a big resistor like that. Yep. Um, both packs will have fuses in. Both packs will have a positive and a negative contactor. Okay. Now, there's a really important reason for using two contactors on positive and a negative. And I have seen some conversions where they don't put a contactor on the negative. And that's right. extremely dangerous. The failure mode for contactors is they weld on. Okay. And if you've only got one contactor and it fails on, then your battery is live when you turn the ignition off. Yeah, that could be rather... Uh... So if the vehicle's involved in an negative. accident, emergency services are coming along to rescue you, mm. and there's still 400 volts knocking around the vehicle. So we have a pre-charge contactor, a negative contactor, and a positive contactor. And every time you turn the ignition on, our control system will check those contactors work by switching each one on individually right. to check that they're not um, stuck. Okay. And if they are stuck? Then it will... Um, disconnect the contactors that aren't stuck and it won't go and how okay 
Is there any warning? Yep. So it'll say okay. high voltage system failure on the dashboard. We'll either put a single light for a warning light or we'll put a little LCD message on there, whatever you want. Okay. But it will tell you there's a high voltage system fault. It will never run the inverter up. It will never power the system up. You're not going to go anywhere. So you can't drive the car where the batteries are stuck on. No. It's also linked into the crash detection system. Yep. So we're putting various sensors in it. So if it does detect you've hit a wall backwards. Yep or rolled it, or whatever you decide to do. It will go through a procedure where it switches off the batteries after discharging the inverter. So it goes to zero power, discharges the inverter, so those capacitors are down, then it switches off both battery packs in about half a second. Oh, wow, okay. And um, how many modules are going in the back here now? Because I think originally, did you say 10 in the back originally? Um, so we, we had quite, um, I've forgotten. <laughs> It's not just me then. Um, uh, I think I think it was a number, and then it was, number. and it then it was, it was one was taken away. Yeah, it was an odd number. So it was a minus one equals b. Yeah. There we go. Simple. Um, I'll, I'll put it on the screen, Ralph. Don't worry. We've already it's fine. discussed it before. We have probably over and over. Many, many, many probably times. they know it better than I. Uh, sorry, he or she, just one person viewer, yeah. uh, might know it better than uh, us. I'm not going to get caught up with pronouns. <laughs> don't don't go there. Don't go there. Okay, that's looking good. So um, so currently battery boxes because you've done the mount for the motor. Battery boxes is what you focus on now. Is that correct? Um, yeah. So battery boxes. We need to finish off the mountings again to make sure that everything's very securely uh, attached. With this yeah. one, we've we've fixed the. Uh, the structural elements that used to hold the seat belts in yep. rusted away completely. The vintage bits, yeah, from the 17th century. Yeah, uh, and we're putting a new crossbar that will go from this side to that yes, side. Yes, that's right. And we're making right. a CDS2 roll cage tube. Ooh, that's, that sounds so a bit that exciting. If someone does decide to smack into the side of your car, um, it'll protect you, mm. and also it'll protect the batteries from yeah. something going into them. Yeah, no, good stuff, good stuff. And... We sorted out the seats, of course. And what's next after that? Just turn the key, right? <laughs> no, we've still got to sort out uh, the whole wiring loop. Right. So the original wiring loop's no use to us at all, really. The only bit we could carry over is the lights. And to be honest, that part of the wiring loop's so rotten anyway, I don't know why you would bother. No, that's good, because so uh, fresh make, sounds good. Yeah, so we'll have to make a whole new wiring loop for the car. Um, and we need to get all the high-voltage wiring sorted out. We need to get the cooling system sorted out. Well, then we've got to get the charge controller, um, get all that mounted up, get the charging point in, um, finish the inverter mountings. Uh, then we've got to do the pedal box. Right. What are we doing for the pedals? Um, so we're going to put a sensor on the existing uh, pedals. Okay. So uh, Attach it to one of those, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but um, one of those things that you attach to the... Potentiometer. One of them. Like um, the accelerator pedal, yeah. we use two potentiometers. So that's a variable resistor, basically. This is so it doesn't get stuck on fast, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. So you've got to use two tracks. Yes, two, two tracks. tracks. Yep, I remember talking about this. The system compares the two. And yep. If one fails, it goes into a fail-safe mode. Cool. If you only use one track, then you've got a single point of failure, and it could go to full power, or indeed zero power. And if you're in the middle of pulling out of a junction, that could be equally dangerous. Yes, definitely. So a twin track system is vital. We also need to put a sensor on the brake pedal. Right. So that we can actually feather in the amount of regen braking you get. Right, okay. So it's progressive as you come off the accelerator and onto the brake pedal. Right, okay. Cool. Well, looking forward to, uh, yeah, the progress because it's, it's really rocking on now. So, yeah, thanks for that, Ralph. And, uh, yeah, see you next time. Yeah, I better get on with it. Yeah, it's, it's taking a while. Send them all.